Hello again, everybody, and welcome to lesson four of our study of the book of James. Uh, as a way of a reminder, as I always do, I uh, want to let you know that this is a verse-by-verse -verse study. So if you don't have a Bible with you, press pause, go find your Bible, and then jump back in, and let's go through the Word of God together. Another reminder, as I always do, is that there are study guides available for this class. There is a web address at the bottom of the screen. Type that web address into your browser. Uh, you can download the study guide for today's lesson. Uh, for this lesson, lesson four, you will need study guide number four, which covers the second half of James chapter two. All right, if you've got your Bible and your study guide, then we're going to jump in and get started. Now, as we jump into the second part of James chapter two, we're going to pick up in verse 14 in just a minute. But I want us to go back to what would have been lesson two and, and the second part of chapter one, uh, to kind of tie this lesson together with context. This lesson is about the relationship between faith and works. And as a, you know, thinking back to lesson two, uh, where James is talking about studying the word of God and then putting that into practice, um, he says that, you know, if, if anyone thinks he is religious but doesn't bridle his tongue, then his religion is worthless. And when he uses that word religious or religion, it's a word that carries with it the idea of the outward acts of religion, the acts of worship, uh, the acts of ritualistic worship, if you will. And then he goes on to say that pure and undefiled religion is this. And he talks about you know, visiting orphans and widows. He talks about keeping yourself unstained from the world. And so there, he's giving kind of three quick practical ways that you can put the Word of God into practice, you know, through your speech, through taking care of those in need, through abstaining from the, the evils of the world. And then we carry over to chapter 2, remembering that there were no chapter breaks when James wrote this. He, he immediately is then talking about abstaining from partiality, which is another way that we can practically live out the Word of God. Now, I think that same idea is in mind when he's talking about this idea of the relationship between faith and works. However, this is more of a, a higher level discussion about, again, living out your, your faith, living out the Word of God practically, um, you know, that it requires action. And so if you've got a study guide, if you look on the first page, which is just a copy of the text, um, I have divided this section, you know, verses 14 through, 20 through 26 into kind of three, three pieces, if you will. And the first one of those, verses 14 through 17, I have labeled as dead faith because James talks about faith being dead. Listen to what James has to say, verse 14. He says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Now, you go back again, back to chapter 1, where he says, if someone thinks they're religious but they are not bridling their tongue, that religion is worthless. And here it's almost like that same kind of conversation. If someone thinks they have faith, but that faith does not lead to works. He says, can that faith save him? I've got a reference on the study guide to Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, 21, where Jesus says, you know, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not just about professing faith with your mouth. It requires action. And then James gives kind of a practical example of this. He says, if a brother or sister, now note there, he's talking about a fellow believer, you know, throughout this, this letter, he's talking about brothers. He addresses the people as brothers. He's talking about a fellow believer. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, which is a, a standard Hebrew farewell, go in peace, be warm and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? And then he concludes kind of this first part with this summary statement, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And on the study guide, I've got the question that says, what does it mean if faith is dead? And in essence, what I think that means is that it's not really 
fake. It doesn't really exist. You know, all of us, as we go through this life, we have to make a decision about putting the weight of our lives onto something. You know, everyone puts their weight, the weight of their lives onto something. You know, we may choose uh, the kind of the human nature, human instinct is to just is to put faith in ourselves that we're going to rely on ourselves uh, to you know to to get through life. Well, then what does our life look like? Our life looks like we're going to do the things that we want to do or the things that we believe we need to do. Well, what if we instead choose to put our faith in God? What is our life going to look like? Well it's going to naturally look like that we're going to spend our life doing the things that God wants us to do, that our faith in God compels us to do. And James says, if that action, if those works are not present that show you have faith in God, then guess what? You don't really have faith in God. Your faith in God is dead. And really, this is implied, your faith is really in yourself because you're, you're professing faith with your mouth, faith in God, but your action is showing that your faith is really in yourself. And so if we're going to live out God's word practically, if we're going to live out our faith practically, there's going to be action involved. There's going to be works involved. There's going to be evidence in our lives of what we do that we have faith in God rather than in ourselves. Now, I want to address this uh, this question that I'm about to kind of deal with in, in the first part of this because it's something that, that a lot of people when they're going through this section will ask, and that is, how does this compare to the teachings of Paul? You know, Paul in his writings has a lot to say about works. Specifically, Paul talks about works of the law and, and works of the law as they relate to salvation or justification. And some will say, well, isn't what James is teaching contradictory to what Paul is teaching? You know, was, was James writing to refute what Paul had written? And honestly, I don't believe that's the case. You know, perhaps James is writing because some were misunderstanding what, what Paul was writing, and James is writing to give more flavor to that. But I don't think James is disagreeing with what Paul has to say. As a matter of fact, I think the writings of James here, the viewpoint of James and the viewpoint of Paul are completely complementary, okay? Now, this is, I, I'm not intending for this lesson to be a detailed study into the teachings of Paul, but if you've got the study guide on the first page in the upper right-hand corner, I have a, refer, a reference to three different sections of Scripture. Uh, I'm not going to go through all three of these because we don't have time, but the first one of those, effectively beginning in Romans chapter 3, verse 19, all the way through the end of chapter 4. I've got Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 15, through chapter 3, verse 6. And then Ephesians chapter 2, a smaller section, verses 8 through 10. Now, I want to quickly um, read a couple of things from Galatians 2 and from Ephesians 2. So, in Galatians chapter 2, as just an example of the teachings of Paul, in Galatians chapter 2, specifically in verse 16, Paul says this, We know that a person is not justified. That means they're, that they're not set free from their sins. They're not saved by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So, also, so we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith, in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So that's just one example of Paul's teaching on, you know, works, the relationship between works of the law and faith. Now, another one of those comes in Ephesians chapter 2. And first of all, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, I just want to read, you know, verses 8 and 9. Paul says this, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Paul says the salvation that you have received is by the grace of God that has, that, that has been enabled to be received by your faith. But it is the work of God. It is God's grace. Uh, and you received it because you put faith in God rather than in yourself. And he says, and this is not your own doing. He says, you did not earn this salvation. 
You know, you have been saved by grace. It is the gift of God, verse 9, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Now, I want to try to summarize what Paul is saying in his teachings. Paul is, is talking about those who think that they can earn their salvation by keeping enough commandments, by living a good enough life to earn their salvation. That they think that by keeping the law, God's laws perfectly, that they can somehow earn their salvation. Now, those that have that mindset, their faith is not really in God. Their faith is in themselves. They believe in themselves. And Paul says, you cannot be saved that way. You cannot be saved by doing enough good things. You can't be saved by keeping enough commandments because you're not relying on God, you're relying on self. Paul says instead, salvation comes by faith, not faith in self, but faith in God. Now, James takes it from there and picks it up and says, now, you're saved by faith, but faith, in order to be real faith, requires works. And if works are not present, then faith doesn't really exist. Well, what's the difference between the works that James describes and the works that Paul describes? What Paul is describing are works that are done for the purpose of earning something, for the purpose of earning salvation, which he says is, is, is not the way it, it happens at all, that it's fruitless to, to think that you can earn your salvation. James is talking about works that are the natural byproduct of true and genuine faith. And, and he says, if you're, you know, if you're going to say you have faith, then it's going to be accompanied by works. Otherwise, that faith is dead. And guess what? Paul had the same belief. Paul, in this writing in Ephesians, ties all of that together. Because if you go back and look at verse 8 again, where he says, you've been saved by grace through faith. It's not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So Paul says, you can't be saved by works. You can't be saved by works of the law. You're saved by grace through faith. But then look at verse 10. Paul says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul says, You can't be saved by your works but we were created for good works, meaning that those who put their faith in God will naturally have good works that follow because of their faith. And so is our works required to demonstrate faith? Absolutely. Is faith required to, to receive salvation? Absolutely. But in doing that, are we earning our salvation like we would earn a wage? No, we're not. God is doing all the work. God has done all the work. And so that is why I say that I believe that Paul and James's teachings are completely complementary because James is saying, if you're just professing that you have faith, but you have no works that show that you have faith in God, then you don't really have faith. Your faith is dead. Just like if you saw a brother or sister who was in need and you didn't do anything about it. Uh, he says, you don't really have faith. Your faith is dead if you don't have works that outflow from that faith. And I hope that makes sense. The next two verses, if you look on the study guide, I have labeled the next two verses as demonic faith because James explains a very important concept in these two verses using demons as an example. He says, but someone will say, well, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. He's just doubling down on saying that you cannot have faith unless you have works, good works that naturally come, that genuinely come out of, out of true faith. He says, you believe that God is one. And writing to a Jewish audience, they would have been very familiar with the Shema, which is from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, that says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You believe that God is one, meaning you acknowledge that there is a God. You superficially believe that there is a God. But then he says, is that enough? He says, you do well, but even the demons believe and shudder. If all you are doing is believing 
in the existence of a God, he says that's not faith because even the demons believe in God. And we saw that in the ministry of Jesus. And I've got a, on the study guide a number of examples on the right-hand side. Um, three different stories from Mark. One of those from Mark 5 that has a parallel in Luke chapter 8. Uh, let me just read a couple of those quickly. And, and so in Mark chapter 3, uh, Mark chapter 3 and verse 11, it says, Whenever the unclean spirit saw him, meaning Jesus, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And so unclean spirits, demons that are possessing people are recognizing Jesus as the Son of God. And then in Mark chapter 5, again paralleled in Luke chapter 8, you have the story of the demon-possessed man who lived in the land of the Gerasenes, which is on the far side of the Sea of Galilee. And I'm not going to read this entire story to you, but this was a man who was demon-possessed. He had incredible strength. He couldn't be restrained with he couldn't be restrained with chains. In Luke's account, it says that he didn't wear any clothes. Uh, and he's, he's going about the countryside. And when Jesus comes to him in, in Mark chapter 5 and verse 7, it says, crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. So this demon that's inhabiting this, this man of the Gerasenes is recognizing Jesus. And so... James is saying that, well, even the demons believe that there is a God, but the demons do not exhibit faith in God. What's the difference? The difference is how they live. The difference is the fruit, the works of their lives. What does it take to show genuine faith? It takes living it out in practice, not just saying with our lips that we have faith in God, not just saying with our lips that we believe in God. It takes living it out. It takes good works. As Paul said, we're God's workmanship created for good works. Do our works cause us to earn our salvation like a wage? No, but works are the natural outpouring of genuine faith in Jesus Christ. So he says, if you believe in God, that's just like demonic faith. That's just like the demons. You've got to have more than just a simple belief. And then finally, in the, the, the longest part uh, at the end of this chapter, I have labeled this as dynamic faith, where Paul gives, sorry, not Paul, but James gives a couple of examples from the Old Testament of individuals who demonstrated you know, genuine faith because of what they did. And he says, verse 20, uh, again, this is dynamic faith. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Meaning back to the that it's dead. It doesn't really exist. There's no faith in God without works that come out of it naturally. He says in verse 21, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? And that's a story that comes from Genesis chapter 22. And you know, that was one of many ways in which Abraham lived out his faith, where he had faith in God. He's the father of the faithful, but God asks him to sacrifice his son, and Abraham was, was going through with it. Why? Because he had faith in God. It was an outpouring of his faith. It was living out his faith. He says in verse 22, you see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. If Abraham had just said, oh, I have faith in you, God, but I'm not going to do what you asked me to do, would that have really been faith in God? Of course not. So he lives it out. And the scripture, verse 23, was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Now, that quotation is from Genesis chapter 15. So several chapters earlier and earlier in Abraham's life, uh, Genesis 15 being one of several places where God reiterates his promises to Abraham. And what's interesting to me about that quotation is that that exact same quotation is used by Paul in Romans chapter 4 in his argument that mankind is justified by faith and not by works. Well, are they, again, are they both right? That is this an example of how, of how Abraham was justified by his works? But Paul says it's an example of how someone is not justified by their works. How does that, how does that fit together? And it's the same as what 
I talked about before. They're looking at works from different perspectives. Paul was talking about works in the sense of earning a wage. Matter of fact, he'll even say that earlier in Romans chapter four, that you know, doing work, trying to live a good enough life, trying to do enough good things, trying to, to follow enough commandments that we earn something like we would earn a wage. And, and again, in Paul's perspective, that means that our faith is not in God, but our faith is in oursel- ourselves that we are going to earn something. And Paul says Abraham is an example of one who, who didn't think that he was going to earn salvation. His righteousness was counted to him because he believed. And James is saying, well, but he is justified by his works because even though he, he believed, that belief was, you know, the outpouring of that belief was that Abraham did what God asked him to do. Did, the, did those things earn his salvation? No, but it dem- they demonstrated that Abraham had faith in God. And so both using the same example of the life of Abraham to, to, to talk about different aspects of works, works to earn something or works to demonstrate that we have true faith in God. And then James gives another example. He summarizes the teachings of Abraham by saying, you see that a person is justified by works. Again, that's the works that come out of genuine faith and not by faith alone, which is something that doesn't exist. There's no such thing as faith alone. If we don't have faith in God, we're putting our faith in ourselves. He says, if you're going to put faith in God, you're naturally going to have works that come out of that. Out of that. He says, in the same way was not also Rahab, the prostitute justified by works, when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. And Rahab is one who's who is talked about by the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 11 in the Hall of Fame of the Faithful, right alongside Abraham as one, uh, as one who demonstrated their faith by what they did. Uh, that Rahab's faith was, you know, turned into action. Her faith resulted in action. Uh, and so in that way, she was justified by her works because her works showed that she had genuine faith in God. And so James ends this chapter by kind of giving a general statement back to this concept of faith being dead. He says, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, you know, the body cannot live without the spirit. So also faith apart from works is dead. And so just again, to kind of summarize, going all the way back to chapter one, where he talks about true religion, pure religion. How do we live out this this study of the word of God? How do we live out our faith? We have to put it into practice, whether that's controlling our speech or taking care of those in need or or staying away from the evil of the world or not showing partiality as James has gone through all of those things. And he's going to revisit the tongue in chapter three. He says, you know, you, in order to to truly have faith in God, your your genuine faith is going to result in works. It's going to result in action that that are going to come naturally because you have decided to put your faith in the promises of God rather than put your faith in yourself. And so I hope that that teaching makes sense um, because it's greatly beneficial to to look at what Paul teaches, to look at what James teaches, and to realize that they're completely complementary. They're completely in agreement with each other just looking at works from different perspectives. One, Paul focusing mostly on works that that individuals would do to earn their salvation, as opposed to works that are the natural outflowing of genuine faith. And as Paul puts those two concepts together in Ephesians 2 by saying, we're not saved by works, but we were created for good works that come out of our faith. These two great teachers were in complete alignment and have, you know, their teachings are complementary to each other. So I hope that that helps. I hope that, you know, thinking uh, diligently about the teachings of James and about Paul will help us to understand the concept and, and the, the idea of what faith really is even more. Uh, I hope that, that this lesson has been beneficial to you. I hope you'll continue on as we jump in the next lesson into chapter three. Uh, I, I hope that God will continue to bless you and, and bless us all. Thank you all very much.